um, webinar series we, exposing students across the country to various uh, careers and all the jobs that uh, are available within them. Um, today, I'm very excited. We have a panel of careers in television, and I think uh, I've had some discussions with media folk and, and um, professors and teachers, and they really want their students to understand more about um, all the jobs that exist. So there's on-air personalities for sure, uh, but all the behind the scenes jobs producing. And, and I think our, our guests today reflect a lot of those positions and very excited. Uh, Laura Bernardini, Vice President of News, CNN, the National Desk, UVM uh, alum, grew up in, in Burlington, I believe. Dad was a cameraman for 40 years at, at uh, local channel WCAX of which we also have Kelly O'Brien, who is a reporter there, a multimedia journalist. Um, and then we have two individuals who I'm very, very appreciative of joining, Professor Vandora Williams, Associate Professor of Communications and Creative Media at Champlain College. And then Keith um, Oppenheim, who has some uh, history with Laura as well, when he was a correspondent, I believe in Chicago with CNN, now as an Associate Professor as well at Champlain. But I'd love to go around and why don't we start with, with Laura and um, go to Kelly and then to both of you at Champlain. Just, just talk a little bit about, introduce yourself, talk a little bit about your own pathway. Hi everyone, um, hopefully you can hear me because you know these days with technology, you never know if Zoom is going to work perfectly. But my name is Laura Bernardini. I grew up in Burlington, Vermont and that's where my entire family remains. I uh, went to Rice Memorial High School, I went to University of Vermont, and never really expected to be in this line of work. I thought to myself I would be a lawyer or a diplomat, you know, I had these sort of different goals in mind, and when I was at the University of Vermont, I became involved in the Vermont Cynic, which was, and still is, the student newspaper. That's how I met John, and, you know, and the post, my affiliation with the paper is how we met. And the thing about it was, is that very early, I learned quickly that every opportunity is what you make of it. I walked into the cynic as someone who wanted to write sports, and that's what I loved, and that's what I, I thoroughly thought was going to be it. And three months later, the sports editor quit. And they're like, hey, do you want to be the editor? I didn't. I mean, I had to bring a friend along to teach me soccer because I had grown up playing field hockey. So it's, you know, those moments happen and you jump at them. And when I left college, I went and worked in Montreal for a year in a production company and a colleague was going to work for CNN in Atlanta in 1996. So that makes me significantly older than all of you. And I, you know, she took my resume and I didn't get the first job, but I got the second job, which was basically an entry level position. And I have been at CNN for 25 years now. And I'm one of those people who have always been behind the camera. I've written for digital, but I've also done pretty much everything behind the organization. And my job now is to make sure we are covered across the country. All the different stories that you see, whether it be you know, Governor Scott talking about COVID restrictions and sort of how that relates to the rest of the country, or, you know, the incredible vaccination rate. That's my team monitoring all of those governors. Or a hurricane. I spent two weekends in a row in September working in August, working hurricane coverage because we had to make sure that we were in the right, we had reporters in the right place. People like Keith or Kelly, you know, would be the people we move around depending upon what's happening and where it's happening. So um, I don't want to keep talking too much, but uh, it's, I've lived by the motto of every opportunity is what you make of it. And we can talk about that more. Thanks, yeah, we, we teach a lot of essential skills that people know them as soft skills often, but perseverance and agility are two of them and you just defined both of those. And I think it's, uh, it's interesting to hear, you know, you may thought you were going in one direction it pivoted, but you rolled with it, took advantage of those opportunities. Um, Kelly, can you tell us a little bit about your pathway? Hi, yeah. Are you going to be able to hear me? I know it's kind of loud in here, so I just want to make sure. Okay, um, perfect. Okay, so I 
honestly never really thought of journalism either until I was in a high school class and we were talking, you know, we were, it was junior year, starting to think that next path forward. Uh, and someone recommended journalism to me. I love to chat with people. I can make a friend out of anyone, everyone says. Um, so I decided to sign up for my senior year journalism class. I ended up going and doing stories throughout my school. Um, I would do, you know, page design layout. And I said, this is something I enjoy. Um, so I, I looked around at some schools. I ended up finding a very small school in the Northeast Kingdom of Vermont, uh, Linden. It was Linden State College. It is now Northern Vermont University at Linden. Um, and I took some classes there and I said, no, this is a good fit for me. I actually started though and I did a production background. Uh, so I was a photographer editor my first three years out of school um, and decided that I wanted to be an MMJ. So an MMJ or multimedia journalist is kind of a, a, a one person band. Um, I go out and I shoot my own stories. I find my own stories. I write them, I edit them. Um, I produce them and then I run my own live shots. Um, so I kind of do all of it. I do my web story, I post it to social media. Um, and it's, it's, it's been interesting all the pathways that I've taken actually to get here, but I think everything I've done has been incredibly helpful because the best part of journalism is you get to learn something new every day. I like to say you get to become an expert in something um, and, and your knowledge always kind of grows, but by doing that, it helps you prepare for your next story. So I think every pathway that I've taken actually has really helped me get to this very spot. Thanks, Kelly. Yeah, I've seen her in action. She's done some great <laughs> stories for us and she's doing about 10 things at one time. I'm, I'm usually baffled by how she puts it all together, but it is interesting to hear that the skills you've learned along the way, you know, kind of contributed to that. We tell students that all the time, you know, that everything you do can contribute to what you do down the line. Um, and, and it's a good segue to, Dr. Williams and Keith, if you want to talk a little bit about, you know, your own pathway and also what some of the things, if someone was interested in uh, pursuing this career, how they might do so, I'd say Champlain. Sure, I, I can go uh, first. Um, hello, everyone. Um, first, I, um, I'm originally from um, Brooklyn, New York, Williamsburg, Brooklyn. And um, I knew when I was very young that I wanted to be a writer. Right. First, I thought I was going to be a fiction writer, love Star Trek. OK, so sci fi, you know, live long and prosper. So um, growing up with my sister, we would write episodes, our own unique episodes together. So that that was a burning passion in me. Um, but I did not get interested in um, journalism until um, high school, where I was asked to join the uh, student newspaper. And, um, and, and then that was it. I was like, okay, not, you know, fiction writer put to the side. I'll wait till I'm 80. Okay, this, this was a 12 year old, uh, 15 year old thinking. I'll wait till I'm much older and, and to, to do the, the fiction writing, but I really wanted to hone in on, on journalism. So it, I, I worked on the yearbook in um, Eastern District High School um, in, in Brooklyn, a couple of blocks away from uh, where, I, where I lived. And then in college, I, I pursued the same thing, worked for the yearbook, um, wrote for, for the college newspaper at Hunter College, um, City University of New York. And then um, when I went to grad school, I pursued that um, knowing I'm, I'm going to be a writer, but do, do something with that. And then I learned in grad school down in Virginia that I'd learned to write with sound and write with video, right? And I said, is that even possible? Yes. And I fell in love with that. It was just like a whole, another world of really diving deep into how to tell stories um, using video, using sound. So that's, that's, where I started. And, um, and then I actually started working for PBS. And, and that's where I really um, started to produce documentaries, news stories, feature stories, uh, worked in um, radio and TV, and even online on the web to, to create a lot of stories. So it, um, my passion for journalism started actually in my, uh, my high school years. So I'll leave it there and then turn it over to Keith and we can talk more. Uh, I'm gonna follow up on the theme of, you know, this all coming to you a little bit late. I was a late bloomer, uh, maybe I still am, uh, because I didn't really get into uh, TV news or journalism until after college. I was a psych major, classic example of somebody who did something different. I was working with kids a lot and was a teacher for kids with challenges and then got a job at a radio station on Cape Cod where I was working. 
that kind of pushed me to other internships, grad school in New York, got my master's. Then I had these three short stints at TV stations in Providence as a field producer, reporter in Scranton, Pennsylvania, yep, uh, to Sacramento for a year and a half, which was good. I had fun there. And then to Detroit, sort of big market for six years, and then to CNN for about 11 years. And at CNN, I was a reporter most of the time for the affiliate service. So that's kind of a little bit like what the AP is to print. It's the part of CNN that makes some pretty good coin on providing tons of content to affiliated stations, like almost all of them. CNN from its start has been very clever in the way it has created these multiple relationships with everybody. So I was serving that mostly, but also on CNN. And eventually I got kicked upstairs to being a general assignment correspondent. And then after that, I went to college teaching. Um, the CNN years were good. They were hard. They were constantly on the go. I called it the civilian army. Um, I got a chance to be with Laura Bernardini uh, for a part of that time during Hurricane Katrina. And the weird thing about the end of the story is that I now live just like half a block from Laura Bernardini's high school. Isn't that bizarre? Anyway, um, the program that we have here at Champlain is a separate question, but I shifted to uh, teaching students how to make content for a media landscape that is far different from the CNN that I left in 2008. Yeah, that's, I, I think that's a good, and Lauren, you could talk, speak to this. The, the amount of change that has occurred I, I, over the past, you know, just few years, but much less 10. Um, I was a journalist myself at daily newspapers, and I, I knew I liked sports and to write, and I thought, well, how can I do that? And I just joined the two and ended up doing that. But by the time I was out of it, it had changed. I mean, things were evolving. What are, if you could talk a little bit, and our students really are interested in kind of like the the day to day, like what you do day to day and how those these things have evolved in your industry. So I, I think a perfect example of the evolution of our business is Kelly's role. That is a very common model that is being replicated throughout the United States. It is to have those skills. But the interesting thing about it is what people don't realize is that the skills that Kelly has, the reporting, the writing, the um, editing, the shooting, all of that is something that will carry her throughout the rest of her career. Because it's one of those things where it is, you know, when I started, it was like, can you write? Okay, you can string a sentence together, you can ask the right questions, you can do things. But now it's about all the different skills that you have. And I think one of the most important things that are there is like, it's, it's learning everything that you can about it. And the, the business is changing because the thing is, is that you, you've read a lot about it, especially post pandemic, the world is moving towards a similar, like there is consolidation. There isn't as much money in the, in how local television stations work or how local newspapers work. I mean, my, I start my day every morning I, for years, it was the Burlington Free Press, but now I read the Vermont Digger. So like there's there's a difference in where people are getting their news that wasn't there. There's so much opportunity. People always ask me, you know, one of the most, they always say, oh, you just must watch your own network or read your own CNN.com. And it's like, no, I watch and read everything. I, I mean, I am constantly refreshing the Washington Post or the New York Times or the New York Post or, you know, the Miami Herald I've become addicted to because we've been focusing a lot of resources towards the Gabby Petito story. And so between that and the Sarasota newspaper, which, you know, you, you just, you adjust to what's there. So I think the thing about it is like, I, I would like to pass the baton to Kelly because I think what she is doing, like I'm management, I sit in an office, I make decisions about coverage and budgets and, and, you know, things that are very much about the safety and security of our team, but she's the one who's really actively involved. And I think, you know, she would have significantly better advice than I would have about where her role is. Sounds like it's my time to start then. <laughs> um, so you can see, I mean, uh, you're constantly on the go. You can see I'm, I'm sitting in the subway right now because I just left my story 
Um, and I wanted to be able to make sure I had Wi-Fi so I could come onto this for you. So you're constantly moving. Um, my best advice is time management and back time, um, which is something I was not familiar with at all until I got into this job. I look at every day, okay, so my story needs to air at five and six o'clock, which means I need to have it written by, you know, um, three thirty, four o'clock. So that way I can give myself from four to five to edit. Now that's in a perfect world. It doesn't always happen. Um, but ideally, you know, you want to set those goals for yourself. Um, and pre-planning is very helpful. So I try to always at least come into my day. I start at like 10 o'clock, 1030 is when we wrap up our morning meetings. Um, I like to be able to know what I'm going to be doing that day before I come in, because I don't want to spend multiple hours, you know, making calls, trying to find it, because then I lose that valuable time. Um, I like to say, so what we, we produce, this, the stories we produce are called packages. Uh, and I like to think of it as a children's book. You know, you want, the visuals are so important, but so is, as you, uh, you were saying, the sound, that is so important. And, and the gnat sound, you know, you really want to take whoever is watching your story there. So I try to really, um, just take everything in when I get to my story or my interview. Um, and I ask people, honestly, I mean, I, like I said, you get to become an expert in something every day, but I'm not an expert in everything I go cover. So I, I tell people that, you know, that's why I'm talking to these, in, these people I interview. I really want them to explain to me so that way I could do my job to explain it to whoever's watching it. Because at the end of the day, if someone doesn't understand what it is you're trying to say in your story, you didn't do a good job that day because now people have more questions. And, and, and so it's really important that you're asking questions while you're out there. And if you don't understand something to ask. Um, so the way that we do things now and, and where I work is you have your one big story a day that you work on. And it's usually about two minutes, which doesn't sound like a lot of time, but in TV, two minutes is a long time. And in, in some markets, you don't even get that. You, you get a minute and that's all you get. Uh, and then we like to try and have a side story. So something else you might be able to pick up while you're out, uh, which again comes to planning. So if I'm speaking to the mayor of Plattsburgh, that's where I live and I work out of, and I know multiple things are going on in, in the city. I'm not just gonna ask him those one question about that one thing I'm there for. I'm gonna say, hey mayor, you know, we're here talking about this day, but this also just happened at the common council meeting last week. Can you tell me why? or who's that gonna impact? So I, I did this yesterday, I got him on six different topics. So now I have six different stories I can sprinkle throughout the next two weeks. And I already have those in my pocket and I already have them ready to go. Um, I think being a member of your community, really understanding what's important, going out and talking to people at your local coffee shop, um, going and, and talking to anyone helps so much because then you understand what the stories are and, and why they're important to your community. Um, I like to think that not every story is important to, to everyone, but every story is important to someone. And that's why it's important. And that's why we do what we do. Um, I think we're really lucky to do this job. I think it's a great job. Um, and and it's, it's hard at first. I mean, trying to figure out everything, it, it, it can be overwhelming. I mean, it's a lot, but once you get it, it's so easy. And I mean, at the end of the day, it's really just talking to people. Yeah, that's um, I'll let um, Keith and Pandora chime in too. But I, you know, it's it's we talk to our students like just what you said, Kelly. Someone who's interested in everything, like how the world works. I, you know, it, it, there's few jobs you could have to learn more about it. You're covering everything. I just remember going to city council and every di different events, and so kids with an interest in things who also have skills. Like I find it interesting today, our students don't even realize the skills that they have. I mean, they're tech savvy, they're way more tech savvy and social media, everything than, than we were for sure. So like they have a lot of these skills, they don't realize it would be transferable to a profession, profession such as this. And I think with, um, you know, Keith and Vandor, I know a lot of the programs you have there at Champlain. I mean, what are some of the, the advice you might give for a student who's interested in pursuing this and what it might be like, you know, you know, a day in the life of Champlain as a major. Keith, why don't you go ahead? Cause I know we're running down on time that I can join in after. Yeah, th uh, thank you, Vandora. Um, this will probably be my swan song, everyone, because uh, students are about to come into the classroom in which I am sitting for a course called Production of Social Media. So I'm gonna answer the question by explaining what that class is and why it's so important. Um, around the time that I left CNN, I was actually, the, the web was actually pretty vigorous. A lot of eyeballs were on CNN's website, which is one of the most, you know, potent uh, anywhere. Um, 
But, you know, people at the time in the late aughts were getting their news more from the direct source, like CNN's Air or CNN's uh, website. And that's still true. But much more common is that people are getting content from referral tra traffic from social media. So being able to uh, know what platforms and how to communicate and create content for different social media sites, whether it be journalism or something promotional or creative or client based is an important skill for us to be teaching here and also to be studying social media as a you know big um, thing. You know, what's happened in the last two years with Trump, Twitter and Facebook and the fact that our former president is no longer um, allowed on one platform and has a two year ban on the other is something to be studied. Uh, so they need to know both the good, the bad, the powerful, the ugly of what social media is, because it's largely how we communicate in a way we didn't do as much before. So that's one thing that we're focusing on here. And although it's largely creating content of different kinds for social media, a lot of video production, um, it's also about understanding the um, academic piece of it too. Pandora? Yeah, and, and to add on to that, along with uh, production of, of social media, we also teach um, show producing, how to produce content for news, for, for a talk show, for a magazine style show, even for sort of like a, a, a documentary series. So um, uh, to your question, John, of what is a, a day in the life of a college student studying broadcast media production, they may come into Keith's class and, and you know, they'll, they know that they have particular assignments that they have to meet. Uh, for me, I like to surprise my students. Um, I teach broadcast writing and show producing this semester. So it's like today they're going to have a surprise. You're doing a radio story about uh, uh, something that's happening now go out and report and then come back and we're, 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 you're going to put that together. Um, and I also like to uh, encourage students to cover content that they have a passion for. So if you, if you, if you love sports or if you, you like gaming, you know, you can do stories um, around that. There are so many different ways to tell stories and to approach stories. I think it's, it's sort of infinite and endless and it will never end. So there is always content there for you to um, grab onto and, and tell a story. So we teach how to think about that, how to examine that, how to find the, the tidbits that, that, um, that you can hang on to and really create a compelling, very interesting story, whether it's um, with sound, whether it's with, with video or um, even just, just with um, graphics, right? Um, text, we also teach that. So we, we try and cover all all avenues to be able to have a graduate who is competent to be able to communicate in all of the platforms that are currently available. And if I could just add one more thing to what you just said, Bandora, playing off of what Kelly was talking about before. Mm -hmm. One of the things I really like what you were saying about Ke Kelly was how at the end of the day, clarity and distilling something potentially complex into a shorter form and making it so that everybody who watches it once gets it, that it's really, really expository and clear. Um, whether students are doing long form, radio, multi-camera, whatever platform, that's always the essence of what has to be working is the ability to, um, through this marriage of pictures and sound and graphics, whatever it is that you're choosing, that it makes sense. Yeah, that's a great point. I, it's really, it's, it's about storytelling and someone who can do it really well you know, it's, it's an amazing talent, but to be able to do it in these different mediums that you're talking about, um, Keith, I think that's where kids that would come to a program like that really could, uh, you know, they might think they know how to tell a story in social media, but that's not the same as, you know, magazine, TV, all these forms. So I think that's a strong piece that probably didn't exist when I, when I was at journalism school it was very, you know, it's press really, you know, it's, 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 it was very more narrow in storytelling. Um, so I think that, and I'd encourage uh, students, I know Keith's got to run soon, but to have, uh, our students, um, check out Champlain and, uh, and see the, the, the majors and so some good explanations, cause there's some niches within that, that, uh, they might want to pursue. Um, 
you know, I think, and Laura, I think it'd be interesting to hear too. I, I always felt like the, I wanted to do a job that did good for people, you know, that, that had an impact in some way. And some of stories certainly didn't and others I felt like they did. And I, and I know that Kelly's done some stories for us about um, programs we're doing with our students that actually impacted other students' lives. I mean, it really did. Um, talk a little bit about the power of journalism, if you would, Laura, and the impact it can have on lives. And maybe some of the interesting pieces that you helped produce early on that you remember. I think it's, it's interesting to hear about in the field and some kind of fascinating things that I know you've done. We're waving goodbye, okay? Yeah, the little critters are coming into the room. Uh oh. Okay, gotta say goodbye. Bye, Keith. Um, so I, I was fortunate in that I spent, oof, I spent over ten years as a field producer, and I had um, my responsibility was to work with different correspondents and come up with story ideas and to do um, to do the digital component, also the television component, because as he said, you know, we've had this platform for, we've had CNN.com for 25 years and it's been, you know, it's the number one website and we, we, we funnel a lot of content that way. Um, in 2009, which seems like a lifetime ago, as I say this, um, I was working with John King and we did a 50 state tour. And I, was I ended up being responsible for 32 of the 50 states. So each week we had to come up with a different story and go there and shoot the story on Monday or Tuesday and then work through the edits, maybe Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, then work through the edits on Thursday and Friday. And then the piece would air on Sunday morning for his State of the Union show. So this is taking back a while. And uh, I did a story in Oregon um, in 2009, to give you the background, the um, economic downturn, which is very similar to what's going on now with the pandemic was happening, and there was a lot of people who were hurting across the country, and we wanted to do a story about sort of how you get resources and how you handle things. And so in Oregon, we went and visited uh, a place called the Relief Nursery, and at the time, I, and, you know, we, you, Kelly will talk about this too, is that you really like use all the resources you have. And so like when I knew I was going to different states, I went on Facebook and oh my goodness, uh, a girl I went to high school with was the director at this place called the Relief Nursery. And I reached out to her and I said, hey, we're looking at doing a piece about sort of the impact on families. And so we ended up meeting a woman who, uh, you know, we went out to do the story. I hadn't seen Gretchen in 15 years. It was great. And then we did a story about a woman who had lost her job, had moved back in with her ex-husband so that her children would have a roof on the, over their head. And sometimes she was living in her car and, and she basically went into the relief nursery and was somebody who in turn um, would provide guidance to other single mothers and what they were going through. So she'd walk around with a binder and hand out papers like, this is where you get a food box on this day. And this is where you can get this done on another day. And so we profiled her and her son. And all of a sudden, all these, you know, incredible offers kept coming in for her about, you know, different, you know, things that people wanted to do to help her. And she kept turning them down and saying, you can give it to the relief nursery. They're saving us. And one of the people who, um, who reached out to her uh, said, you know, we'll give your family a week vacation at our resort in your Oregon. And she said, no, no, no. And they in turn hired her and put her, put them, put her through their management training program. And so like when you have those moments where you realize like you've, you've spotlighted something that is important for people to realize and remember. And then at the same time, you've also changed something and a trajectory. I mean, to this day, we are still in touch. When she got remarried, I sent her a present. Like it is a, it's a, it's, a responsibility to to what you do and and it's it's one of those things where it's really important when you, to get the facts and tell the story i've had great stories like this and i've had stories where i've been like oh my god you know this craziness um but it's it's important to to tell people stories cleanly accurately and totally have that privilege and responsibility 
Yeah, that's powerful. I know, I mean, you've covered a lot of stuff over the years and to remember that one and the significance of it is, is amazing. Um, Kelly, anything you'd want to share? I know you, you've done a lot in this I, read. It's impactful. Yeah, I, I do want to jump off actually something that Laura was just saying. I like to say that we have the opportunity to be there on the best and the worst day of people's lives. And you really need to take that responsibility seriously. Um, it, it, you know, these stories you tell are so important because it, it could mean everything to this person whose story you're highlighting. Um, I also think during this last, what, going on year and a half, almost two years, it's shown how important your news is, both on a national level and a local level. I mean, it really was people tuning in for several hours a day, watching us live stream. We cover three states at WCAX, our three governors giving an update of your state, the, the, the mandates, the, the numbers of COVID. I mean, it was so something that most of us have never been through. Um, and, and so it was so important. People were gluing in, they were calling us, they were thanking us for sharing this information, this vital information for, for their lives. Um, and I think that it's just shown so much. And I, I've been really proud and grateful to, to be this lifeline for people. Um, it's, it's, yeah, I mean, I have so many stories that are near and dear to my heart. Uh, I love, I'm a, I'm a sucker for a feature story, which is like a feel good, happy story. I love them. They bring me so much joy, that warm, fuzzy feeling. Um, so those are usually the tops of my list, but I've also done investigative deep digging into, you know, serious tax questions and, and police chief questions in my community, found answers that people needed. Um, so, I mean, there's, there's a lot that stick with me, but again, I just stick with, I'm really grateful to do this job and to, to help share the voices and the stories of my community. And if I, if I can add to that, being, being the professor that I am, um, I tell um, the students that you are the 21st century history stories history storytellers. You are recording history. It may, it may not seem important to you, or you may want to do more about who, who JLo is dating, which, okay, if I understand that there's a space for that, but um, talking about what's happening in, in the city or, or in someone's life, it, you are documenting that. And then uh, 20, 30, 40, 50 years later, someone is reading your content, documenting someone's life. You're providing context. You're you're you're, you're providing in, information, and it is an extremely important job of of a journalist is that you're documenting that. And I go through them with you know, a 100 years ago we were in a pandemic, and I had them look at um, newspapers that that um, were covering that 100 years ago, and they were able to see the connections, and they were like, wow. You know, and, and it actually helped them to say, well, maybe, well, what stories weren't being told? What voices were not part of that um, reporting at that time? Um, and to think about, well, let's see if we can't um, find those um, voices and tell those stories now. So I think that's really, really um, important. Well, and to pick up on something that Pandora was saying, I don't know if we have any schools from the Buffalo, New York area on, but that's where my my husband is from. And so we went to the Teddy Roosevelt inauguration site. And it was fascinating because the National Park Service has a wall there that says there are no, there's no video or pictures because Teddy Roosevelt decided he didn't want press covering his, um, his uh, inauguration. And I thought to myself, because at the time I was the director of coverage in Washington and it was during the Trump administration and we spent a lot of time arguing with the administration on access issues. And it's interesting how there is, whether you're looking back at a pandemic or you are looking at an inaugural site, it's the first pass of history. It's that moment in time that gives everyone that chance to see what was happening in that time. And it's really, really important. And with all the volume of opportunity you have to record that or to tell those stories, it's it's in going to be an incredible overload for historians a hundred years from now who are going to go back and look and be like, oh, wait a minute, what was really happening in the United States at that time? 
Yeah. yeah and, 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 and just to say the one, one of the main reasons why I pursued journalism was that I wanted, um, I noticed that in, in New York City, where I grew up, um, the voices of the minority communities were only covered around a certain theme, right? If it had to do with crime, if it had to do with tragedy, um, you know, that, that, would, that was covered there. And I wanted to make sure that I was in the room when these uh, decisions were being made and say, why don't you talk with this person to, 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 to diversify um, the voices that were, were being presented um, within, within the news media. And um, I believe I was successful in that and in many different levels just to be able to, to do that. And I think that's also um, very important and it, and it was definitely a driving force uh, for me. Yeah, finding, I mean, I, you think how history has been told and, I, you know, today, I, my own kids even, you know, they, they have to, there's such a multitude of resources that they go to, social media, online, they're getting all this information. And a lot of times, you know, they'll share and I'll be like, that, you know, that I, you just, I just know it's not true, some of what they're saying, or the perspective that they got, to your point, Dr. Williams was just, it was a one, you know, this group of people, it was just one perspective. Um, it, it concerns me a little bit that there's so much information that's not, that isn't accurate that I, because I, I'm older, I'm like, I trust CNN, I trust local, I, you know, I actually trust certain news sources. To, to, to put forth the accurate, I know, you, Kelly, you really work hard to, you know, when I, when I see the sources you use, you get different voices and you want to make sure you're telling the, the, the the accurate version that's got to be can be daunting at times i'm sure huh to make sure that you're putting forth what you know you're bringing different perspectives so some of it may not be as totally accurate but they're bringing in is that talk a little about that is that is that challenging to you know you after you i remember writing stories thinking boy i hope that was that was completely accurate and i felt like it was but talk a little bit about that any of you if you would um, so you said me, so I'll, I'll start. Um, I think your judgment comes in a lot when, especially depending on what you're talking about. I mean, going back to to what I said earlier, you want to make sure people are fully understanding and, and you need to make sure you're accurate. At the end of the day, we're truth tellers. You know what I mean? That's the whole point of journalism. Um, so I, I'm always kind of keeping that mind open. I think that checking multiple sources, there's nothing wrong with that. Checking to make sure that all of these sources are saying the same thing before you go forward with it. I also think that I would never put a story on air that I'm unsure about. I would never do it. Um, I know yesterday I had a very uh, convoluted story and I, I told them, I said, I can't have this for you at five o'clock. It has to be moved to six o'clock because I need that extra time to really sift through everything and make sure this is accurate and I'm comfortable with having my name attached to it. Um, so I, I think there's that's kind of how I go behind it. Um, I do agree that you need to have a diverse group of voices in a story because people have different opinions on things. Their opinions are not incorrect, but you need to make sure it, there is some fact behind it. You can't just put anything on air. Do you know what I mean? Um, but I think that people have different viewpoints and, and that's our job to show them. So everything that appears on our air has to go through an approval process and it depends on what the approval process is, whether it be, I, I mean, I approved many scripts in my life and looked through and talked to the reporter about their sourcing and, you know, double check the facts. Um, but there are, um, you know, there are issues that need, for example, you've got to make sure you're legally set on some stories. You need to make sure, for example, especially now during a pandemic, like the health team will look at scripts or look at stories that get published just to make sure that, you know, the experts are speaking authoritatively and do, you have to do your due diligence. And I think it's, you know, there are, there are times where you have to, it's like, I'm in the middle of something with one of my team where I'm like, I need to put the brakes on this. You need, and like, I let, I put together a list of Three different things that I that I expected before a story would move forward, and you know one of the tricks that I have learned is, you know, especially with things like investigative reporting, it's like, well, what do you know and what do you need to know to push a story forward? Like, what type of reporting do you need to go out and get that validates what you are hearing? And so it's, I'm sure that you know it is 
it's something for some people that just has become second nature. But it, when you're learning through the process, you have to be very careful and that due diligence is really important because it's your name, it's your brand, individual brand, but it's the greater brand of the organization as well. And I think it's interesting because there's right now I'm reading a, the book about Netflix that Reed Hastings wrote and they have a whole model that is based off of, you know, you do good for their company. And it's interesting because you, you have to remember you're not just organization and if you're part of if you're just reporting on your own if you are putting things on twitter that's what you are saying and it is tied to what you are doing and you know your instagrams your twitter pages those are all something people will look at and it's it's you know it's a very different world than when i was in college and it's a very different world that you know people look back and look at different things and and just to and and Thanks, thanks for for saying all that. I'd agree with Kelly and Laura about that. It's also on my end, I'm teaching how to um, evaluate um, stories and and to make sure that you are um, doing your your due diligence with with the research and making sure those questions are answered. Did you talk to um, an, an expert? You're at a college, you know, you have researchers here who are doing that on, on a daily basis. Let's reach out uh, to them and let's get up, let's get some perspective or context um, with that. So that is something that um, we, it, it starts, you know, where, where you need to learn how to do that uh, properly. Right, and to make sure that all of those um, areas are, are are covered. Thanks. Yeah, I want to make sure I'm, that's that's thinking of resources and, and how to get the correct information is everything. Um, I'm going to be cognizant of time too. I know you all are very busy. Um, but I think it's interesting, you know, given what you all just said to to produce a story and making sure it's accurate. If you could talk a little bit about in Laura, you know, your dad being a cameraman, and I remember it, it might have been on the Fifty State story you're talking about, but I know you came to UVM one time and you, I think it was a story on, I think George Bush was president and the only state he hadn't visited was Vermont at the time, I think. And you had interviewed a professor at uh, uh, UVM. And I, I remember you had a camera guy, a person with you and this professor talks a lot and, and he was talking quite a bit and the camera didn't actually go on until like, you, I think you gave him a little point, like you knew where the, the important stuff was and then you started and I thought, well, that's I was fascinated by that, but if you could talk about um, the people behind the scenes is the wrong word, but uh, people that have different jobs to help produce all these stories. So I know our students are curious about if I'm not on air or producer, what else, what else can I do to be part of this exciting field? So I actually was lucky because yesterday I did a presentation to some of our entry level um, employees at CNN and some of our starting journalists. And so I went back and like I said, I've been at CNN for 25 years and I counted and I had, I've had 12 different jobs in 25 years, which sounds crazy when you think about it, but there are so many opportunities. It takes so much to do. I mean, Vandora was talking about, you know, line producing. CNN has 10 now, 10 different divisions. You have, you know, all your platforms. I'm in one part, which is news gathering, which is the, um, the people who are uh, going and reporting out the story. So all your reporters on air belong in my group. All of the, um, you know, the people like assignment editors that are making calls on stories or listening to press conferences, they're part of my team as well, along with, um, you know, the producers in the field. Then we have image and sound, which is all the editors, all of the, the, news, uh, the um, news photographers, as John was saying, all of the the graphics people, all of the technical production folks who work to get our studios on air. We are going to be launching next year CNN Plus, which is a digital platform, which will have completely different content than CNN Linear, which is the, you know, the first brand that was created in 1980. We have International, which is a, a broadcast that is that follows the sun, which is a fascinating concept. You have major hubs in Atlanta, London and Hong Kong, where as the sun goes up and follows, they each take control of different parts of the day. So you'll have 
broadcasts from Abu Dhabi and from Hong Kong that will cover the Asian portion. You'll have London's broadcasts along with stories that are generated through, you know, the rest of the world that's come through there. And then Atlanta will take over in the middle of the day Eastern time. So it's just, there's so many opportunities. There are people who write, who write for digital or who write for television. There in every style is different. And I think, you know, the thing about this all is that there is just a multitude of opportunities that are there. And if you think like, for example, as you know, Kelly was saying, I am sure she writes digital components to her stories because she needs to put those together, they get married, they get put on the website and live forever. And then at the same time, she's also writing her scripts to appear on television and her package to, to go along with all of that. So there's, there is so much. I mean, producers today, write packages for the correspondence when there's a time crunch or they are in the field. I mean, we have different types of producers. I manage a group of producers called site managers. They're the people we send in on big stories. They're the ones who make sure that they're, they're, they're giving all the resources that are needed. That's a whole different level of experience than somebody who's going in the field or doing a stakeout at a Sunday show. You know, there's just, there's tons of things out there. And this is just talking digital and television. Forget like, you know, newspapers and magazines. I mean, if you don't follow it, the New York Times is digital components. They're up for, they've been nominated for Emmy Awards for their television piece, their, their television style pieces. I mean, their digital storytelling is so, so good. So, you know, there's opportunity that sort of crosses platforms as well. And I would add um, that where we, we, we have a motion graphic specialization because, because we know graphics and, and animation are extremely important to the part of, of, of storytelling. So um, we, we, we have that. Even if, if, if you love building uh, computers, but you want to, but you're also interested in journalism, you know, there, there, I think there is... <laughs> Um, a space for you, we, uh, software engineers, right? In order to create the 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 apps and 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 uh, the, the the software to be able to get that information out and 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 make it adaptive to to the audiences, right? All of that right. is really important. Well, and we have a whole programming unit, and it's not programming for television; it is programming for the web. How to make the experience that people have on their phones or on their desktop unique and special and run well. So to that point, like the technology, I feel fortunate that where I work because we try all the time to in innovate and come up with new things. And like we were some of the first, we, we have CNN Air, which is one of the first drone units in the um, in broadcast media. And we use those drones. Like I was actually just messaging, we're moving some around the country right now and like where the operators are going. So that is something that like, you might not think about it, but if you love drones and want to go get licensed as a pilot, that is a fruitful, fruitful, fruitful uh, future because, you know, between private industry and also journalism, there's so much use for that storytelling that gives you that perspective. Yeah, that, that's amazing. Yeah, th what's emerging in so many different fields, this one alone is, is a lot. Um, yeah, uh, Kelly, yeah, if you want to mention anything, like I think it's interesting, we've had students say, hey, how do I start, you know, from Linden or Champlain, you know, locally, and they're like, well, how do I get into a local market just to get in to, to some of these jobs on the, you know, in local stations, and then, as Laura said, you know, kind of at an organization like that, it's huge, but, um, and then if you want to address that, Kelly, and then I'd love for any, people want to close out with, you know, any, any words of advice, it doesn't just have to be professionally, it's for our kids, it's been a tough year. You know how they can persevere through this whole thing and just you know they all want to obviously they all want to be successful and do well so i want to just leave it open to anything you'd want to say to them um so kelly if you want to start with um i think reaching out it, it never hurts to reach out i have people from our local college email me i've spoken to classes i mean i'm happy to share my story i'm, I'm here any anything um, i'm on social media i have an email um i, I talked to people in the streets. I'm always happy to talk about this. I think that it can't hurt. You know what I mean? There are internships. 
for that exact reason to help get your foot in the door if you if you want to do that my best advice is once you do get that foot in be a sponge be a sponge be a sponge be a sponge absorb absolutely any everything and anything someone will teach you um I've worked just about every single shift in a newsroom. I've done just about everything in a newsroom. And I think it makes me better at my job because now I, I not only know how to do it and what goes into it, I understand what the person who is in that role goes through. Um, and I think that that's worked. I mean, there's no I in team, right? We all work together. We all, it's a moving, moving machine to get a, to get a newscast on air. Um, I think you've got to have a lot of respect for your team. Um, and I think that reaching out to your local news or or your your local paper or whatever it is that you're interested in, um, people are going to want to share their story. I, I can't. I don't know any journalist that would say no. I'm not going to talk to you. I don't know any of them. Um, so I think reaching out. Um, and I think that I know it's also a cliche, but there's no dream too big. Um, I, I'm a big believer that if you work hard and you want something, you will get it. You will work there. But no, nothing's going to be handed to you. This is something you got to put your work into, and it, it, it takes blood, sweat, and tears, but it's worth it at the end. Yeah, that's awesome. I, that's, that makes me want to get back in journalism. <laughs> um, Laura or, or Vandora, anything else you want to add uh, just in terms of advice? Sure, I will um, add this. I. Um, Growing up in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, I grew up in the projects, um, and I never thought that um, I would be a, a journalist that would travel uh, to Africa to cover um, events, travel um, over the all over the country to cover different types of events for for a local PBS station. I I never thought that um, I would be a college professor right now being able to um, teach in my in, in my passion. Um, and the one thing that I did was I, as Kelly said, I dreamed big and then I just went for it. I just went for it. So your dreams, follow them, follow your passion and, and go for it. Um, you may find out, you know what, I really loved it, but I don't actually like to do it. That's a great information, that's great information to have. So you can go ahead <laughs> and move on to something that you want, want to do. And in, in this current, uh, the 21st century, we're going to have three or four or five different careers. Follow your passion and, and, ju and just go for it. I cannot tell you, um, how, it, it, and it was scary for me. And I, I had a mother who said, you are not allowed to be fearful. So every time I was afraid to, to step out, uh, she gave me that push. So I did have some, someone to, to support. So find people who support you and will push you forward and not drag you down. So I definitely agree with everything that Pandora and Kelly said. And I will tell you a little tiny story, which is that like growing up in Burlington, Vermont, I never expected to travel the world and I never expected to, um, to do any of this. Like I sort of thought it was, well, I dreamed big and I thought, oh, I want to be a field producer. I never, ever thought that I would be in this situation. And it is interesting how life hand you these these moments and um i had the incredible responsibility and you know it shock of being travel to school one day for the white house when i got to fly on air force one and i was really really scared like i i i was like you have the responsibility of all five television networks to give them the accurate information of what is happening and you have to send a note and you have to send notes and updates and everything like that and I was like, oh my God, this is so scary. And I looked up and one of the cameramen, like we were all gathered to, they basically, they sweep you, which is basically put you through security. And then they gather you together before you get on the plane. And one of the report, the cameramen who I didn't even know at the time had a University of Vermont hat on him. And I was like, it's a sign. Like, it's going to be okay. <laughs> this is not like, 
oh my God, like if I needed something to calm me down, that's what it was. And so like, just realize that when you get in the game, you're in the game for a reason and you do those great jobs and you're just going to keep doing better and you're going to keep having great experiences and you're going to keep building upon those experiences. And like, I still use all of the knowledge that I gained and 25 years ago, I still, you know, treat everyone exactly the same way as I did when I started. I, you know, treat people with respect. I treat people I, as opportunities to learn from. As Kelly said, like, someone stops me on the street, I'm going to talk to them. If somebody wants to, like, John, if anyone asks for my email address, send it their way. Like, I, I truly, like, I feel that it's my responsibility to help impart the knowledge that we all have gained from all of the experiences we've been fortunate to have because you're going to have phenomenal experiences that will far outweigh all of this when you get in the game too. Uh, thank you so much. I mean, I, you're, you're all three of you have exemplified everything that we're trying to, to teach these students and, and, and you're, you're living it and talking about it is it's inspiring for sure to all them. And I, you've brought up, um, the passion, uh, getting our students to get into something that they're passionate about. And clearly you all three are passionate about your professions, but also just about helping other people and you're, and you're, and you're doing it. And so we can't tell you how much we appreciate you taking the time and we'll share this with our, you know, like 20,000 students across the country. And I, I know they'll, you know, even if, even if it's not TV, you know, um, that they get into the passion and what it takes to be successful, uh, you know, like Pandora said, sometimes it's finding out what you don't like and then finding your passion. And I, um, I think they'll be passionate about whatever it is, whatever it is, whatever it is they pursue, um, and, uh, and take heed everything that you said. So thank you so much. And, uh, well, if students have questions, I'll, I'll send them out. And, uh, you know, I know you have, I realize how busy you are. You're all have incredibly busy schedules. So thank you so much. And, um, we'll stay in touch. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Appreciate it. Have a good one.